Napoleon said, number one, a leader needs unwavering courage. And I, I don't know if I totally agree with the unwavering part of this or not, because sometimes our courage does waver a little. You know, bend but not break. Um, you know, courage mounts up and then sometimes we have the doubts that creep in and we reach a little deeper to find that courage that overcomes our doubts and our fears. So I would probably debate a little bit with Napoleon on this unwavering courage because sometimes courage does waver. But as long as it stays, as long as the, in the end there it is to serve you, uh, the courage to do what you didn't think you could do, the courage to step into territory that might be a little unfamiliar, the courage to talk to somebody you don't know, the courage to attempt conducting a meeting, the courage to give your first testimonial, uh, the courage to, uh, you know, solve problems you couldn't solve before, that kind of courage. Uh, the courage to stand up when it's sort of dark in your corner, the courage to do it when it isn't going your way seemingly, uh, the courage to try to have a good day in the midst of a bad day, that kind of courage. Wavering a little at times, yes, because we all have doubts that attack us, we all have uh, small fears that creep in, that is the nature of life. But that's what faith is all about. That's what courage is all about, to serve us. When our doubts will not serve us well, faith to overcome fear and courage to overcome our doubts. But that is a good quality, a good attribute for a leader, and that's unwavering courage. Second, Napoleon said self-control. That, of course, is the very essence of life itself is self-control because we all have this warfare going on you know it's going on in the world the warfare between liberty and tyranny uh, in our own body the warfare between health and illness the struggle is on uh, the struggle between light and darkness the struggle between good and evil i call it opposites in conflict and as soon as you're born into the world, as soon as you find yourself and discover yourself on this spinning planet headed somewhere, you know that this exists. Uh, to be a civilized society, we must drive the dark side of our nature into a small corner and let the positive side flourish. Uh, early, we must learn to exercise self-control. Uh, power is a wonderful thing, but it must be exercised properly. It must be exercised to benefit, not to destruction. So self-control is certainly necessary uh, to be a strong leader so that you can become the best example. The example of having your temper well managed, to having that dark side of your uh, nature under control. The best example of choosing wise words and not being careless, that kind of control. Uh, control of your appetite, control of your um, desires so that they fit into the positive side of life and not the negative side. Self-control, very important. Then he said a leader must have a keen sense of justice. How very true. Justice we become familiar with, you know, even when we're small when certain things that happened or were done to us that we, something told us that wasn't right. Something did us, someone did us wrong. We have that sense of right and wrong and it starts very early. Then we have to have that sense of utilizing what's right and what's wrong so that we develop this sense of justice, this sense of being fair, the sense of being on the positive side, on the right side. Uh, to minimize a person's mistakes, they need to have this sense of justice. Uh, we have to have justice when we're building an organization. You know, what's fair, what, what is a good balance. Um, the marketing system that Mark put together uh, has to be fair for everyone. 
If you have a customer and you take care of that customer, someone else cannot come along and, and take that customer. The same is true with the distributor. Certain rules and regulations so that all of us have a chance to fit within this framework of fairness, justice, and what's right. Uh, otherwise, enterprise cannot work. Otherwise, we have what we call in a political sense, anarchy, where there is no justice. When um, might is the order of the day, power is the order of the day, not the law, not the rule, not what's right, but power. And we would all dismiss that. It's been a catastrophe in the last 6,000 years, uh, the governments that resorted to power instead of democracy, that resorted to intimidation instead of freedom. And we all know the terrible toll that that takes. But it takes a toll not only politically in a country or politically around the world, but it takes a toll even in enterprise. It takes a toll in school if a teacher is unfair. It takes a toll in working on a team where someone is unfair or where the leadership is not fair in the administration of justice. So this is true. A keen sense of justice and what's fair and what's right. Part of this we have to learn as we go. You know, you don't have it all the first year. You haven't got it all the second year, the third year. After all the years that I've, you know, been around, uh, both as a human being and as a as a business person, we're still, even at, at these years, trying to decide what's best, what's fair, what's right, uh, to give balance to our life and to build on a firm foundation for the future. So I agree with Napoleon, good idea, a sense of justice. Here's another one he said, definiteness of decision. Indecision is the thief of opportunity. If you don't decide, the opportunity could slip away. If you don't decide what you're going to do today, the day could get away and you're not very effective. I talked about in my recent travels uh, about time management. And here's one of the best ideas of time management. Don't start the day until you have it finished. Is it possible to finish the day before you start it? And the answer is yes. If you don't finish it, to the best of your ability, have some idea, some good plan, sure enough, the day escapes. And in the morning you say, let's see, what should I do now? In the afternoon you say, hey, time's getting away from me, what should I do now? And now most of the day is lost. Most of the day escapes not being utilized and uh, doesn't work for you simply because uh, you didn't make those decisions early at the early part of the day. The decisions we make in the early part of our life sometimes last for a lifetime. The early decisions that you make about what you're going to do with your life, as far as herbal life is concerned, those decisions are vitally important. If you neglect them and don't make them, sure enough, the time passes and the opportunity sometimes is diminished. And sometimes you spend a lot of time now catching up simply because you didn't make those early decisions. So it's the decisions at the first of the day. It's the decisions at the early part of the month. It's the decisions at the early part of the year that greatly determines what kind of year you're going to have. The, the decisions you make in the early uh, days of your marriage, sometimes those are the decisions that affect the marriage for a lifetime. The decisions you make at the first chance you see opportunity, those decisions, what you're going to do with it, how far you're going to take it, what it's going to be uh, meaning to you in the years to come. Those early decisions are vitally important. Then we need decisions to correct poor decisions, to overcome our mistakes. It's possible, of course, for all of us to make unwise decisions. And at the end of one year, at the end of one week, one month, or at the end of a few years, we say, that decision cost me too much, cost me a lot of time, cost me a lot of money, uh, cost me maybe a good relationship, uh, cost me a chance to be productive. But as long as you're alive, there's still a chance to use new decision power to correct the mistakes of decisions that were bad in the past. All of us have the opportunity to do that, but I think Napoleon was right here too. 
You gotta be definite in making decisions so that the opportunity doesn't pass you by. Take advantage. Here's the next one. Napoleon Hill said, a good leader has definite plans. How important that is. And of all the years, I think, to cash in on Herbalife's momentum and make some plans for the future, this has got to be one of the greatest years. Herbalife in these 18 years now has created some incredible momentum, not only in opening up the countries, but momentum in the refinement of our marketing, uh, momentum in uh, developing new products, uh, momentum in developing our support system. The key is now for you to make plans to ride on that momentum. Herbalife is like the tide that comes in and the rising tide lifts all the ships if they're in the water. If your ship and your boat is not in the water, even though the tide comes in that would lift all the ships, uh, if yours is not in the water, then it doesn't benefit you. So here's what you should do. Have the same intensity to make your plans for the future as Mark Hughes has, as the President's team, Chairman's Club especially, make the plans for the Herbalife Company future. You've got to now make your plans. Uh, don't let this momentum pass you by. Don't let this momentum go uncashed in on. Uh, don't let it be like a lost cause for you. And maybe you've, because of the lack of plans, have lost a month or two, or you've lost a week or two, or maybe you've lost a year, and you were 10% effective instead of 100%. Now's the time to change all that and start making some plans. Your Herbalife plans, they're vitally important. You might as well cash in on the Herbalife plans for world expansion, the Herbalife plans for expansion within your country, uh, the Herbalife plans for the expansion of the business, the incentives. You know, cash in on that, capture that, and say, I've got to have some plans that match Herbalife. Not necessarily match Herbalife in numbers, but that can match Herbalife in momentum that can match Herbalife in cashing in on the opportunity, your plans for Herbalife expansion. You gotta have some plans for your family, right? You got to take your family along, don't leave them out. One of the challenges all of us have in making our plans is how to balance everything, uh, to make sure that we don't regret at the end of the year, I spent too much time on that. I spent too much money. And then if you have, say, how can I not do that again? And construct some better plans uh, so that you won't have any regrets at the end of a year to come, five years to come, three or four, five years to come. Definite plans. The plans for the use of your money. One thing I've admired about Mark Hughes since I've met him all those years ago, once he started becoming successful, he had a splendid plan, not only for his personal success in terms of financial security but in terms of the company because mark has to look after the company and make sure that the company is secure that the company has plenty of reserves so that no matter what happens around the world and when you're doing business in 37 countries you can imagine what the challenge is to make sure the plans for each country are there the backup plans uh, the financial plans as well as products and opportunity and marketing it is a challenge beyond comprehension to most of us uh, what kind of planning that takes in terms of trying to make herbal life secure for the future. I described it in one of the summit classes as Mark takes the same pledge that the President of the United, takes, the United States takes, and that is to preserve and protect and defend the Constitution, says the President. But Mark has to preserve and protect and defend the company to make sure it's viable, not just in America where it started, but all around the world in each country. It's an awesome responsibility. But now for you, your plans, your plans to be financially secure. If you're starting to make some big money in Herbalife, I'm telling you, you gotta have a good plan for your resources so that you find yourself secure regardless of what happens. I agree with Napoleon here, you gotta have good plans. 
one more on plans, and that is the plan for your personal development. The plan to be better this year than last year. The plan to take the classes, attend the, uh, the workshops, do everything you possibly can to show personal progress, not just financial progress, not just the progress of having one more car or one more home, but the progress of personality, the progress of communication skills, uh, the progress of recruiting skills, uh, the progress in how to deal with people, progress in using your influence so that it multiplies its power by five by 10 versus what it used to be. You need those kind of plans. A plan for personal growth, personal development, a plan to be all that you can possibly be in the years to come as you develop your Herbalife business and your life business and your family business, all of that. Got to have good plans. Next, Napoleon Hill had a good saying. It was something my father had and passed it on to me as a good philosophy. And here's what he said. A good leader has the habit of doing more than what he gets paid for. What an incredible philosophy this is. The habit of doing more than you get paid for. It's what we call the service that you put out like seeds in the ground that doesn't bring the harvest immediately, but the harvest is yet to come. It's called like putting out the capital in capitalism. Uh, doing more than you get paid for means that you're getting ready for the next move up. Because if you do more than you get paid for, you've made an investment. Uh, the average person might think if I do more than the company requires, uh, you know, then they're ripping me off. You know, I'm not getting paid for that extra time, that extra attention. But you must not view it that way. You must say I'm getting there a little earlier, staying a little later as an investment in my own personal future. Because I want that kind of reputation. I want that kind of philosophy to work in my life. Do more than you get paid for. And this philosophy works incredibly well in Herbalife. You make the Herbalife sale of the Herbalife products. Now you must do more than you've gotten paid for, right? They've got the product, you've got the money, but you can't stop your investment there. Now you must develop the investment in time, effort and energy in turning that new customer into a testimonial. And sometimes that's the most difficult work, the work after the sale. Because the sale might be fairly easy. Someone says, hey, I've been looking for this product. I need it. Here's my money. But now you've got to stay with them, make sure they don't just buy the product, but that they use the product. And that they don't just use the product, they keep using the product. That's the work after the sale. But if you learn to make that kind of an investment and do more than you get immediately paid for, the payoff in the future can be fantastic. Because as we all know in Herbalife, what really pays off is not a sale of the product. What really pays off is a testimonial. A testimonial that gives you more sales than you can keep up with. A testimonial that takes you places you could never go by yourself, introduces you to people you'd never see on your own. That kind of investment is so powerful. So you do more than you get paid for up front. It's happened for me, making the investment. When I first started lecturing 36 years ago, I talked to high school classes, college classes, uh, service clubs, and I gave it all away. I went and talked for free. Someone said, Mr. Ohm, would you come and do this breakfast talk? I said, sure. Uh, could you do this luncheon talk for this service club? I said, of course. And all of that in the beginning was for free, primarily because I'd made my fortune. You know, I didn't need the money, but um, I did it for free, but look what it's made for me by giving that kind of service in those early days. And finally, it led to business and led to an enterprise. And I was giving the seminar all those years ago here in Los Angeles, and Mark Hughes was in my audience. So what you don't get paid for, don't worry about that. Just render the service with the vision of the future that it'll come back multiplied if you have this kind of habit this kind of philosophy.
Winter comes after fall. Night comes after day. Difficulty follows opportunity. Recession always comes after expansion. It's been the rhythm of life for the last, last 6,000 years of recorded history. So the winters are gonna come. The winter of sickness, the winter of disappointment, the winter of devastation, social winters, economic winters, personal winters when your heart is smashed in a thousand pieces and the nights are unusually long. It's simply called winter time. But the winters are inevitable. So it has been for the last six and a half thousand years recorded history. You say, well, Mr. Rohn, what can I do about the winters of life? That as you go through the challenges of life and you look at it and embrace whatever comes to you, don't run from it. Step toward it. Don't try and duck it like most people do. See, most people want it easy. See, if you easy come, easy what? Easy go. And literally what I've learned in these moments is that I have to stop listening to myself and I have to start talking to myself. I'm like, Rich, you're great. I'm like, looking in the mirror like, you can do this. Rich, you can handle this. Rich, this is not a big deal. Rich, this is gonna pass. You're amazing. Rich, this too shall pass. You've got to find ways to increase your sense of self-appreciation because if you don't, you're bombarded with negative stuff every day that beats you down and you will find yourself unconsciously engage in self-destructive behavior. If you don't program yourself, life will program you. There's two sides of pain. There's one side of pain that's the suffering and the discomfort side of pain. But then there's another side of pain that's called effort. It's called glory. And if you never tap into it, it's because the first time you felt that you backed off. The first time you felt ah, that burn. The first time you felt that ah, it's too much. We rationalize with ourselves to where we automatically stop. That's why a bunch of us give up so much in life so quickly. But suppose I told you the greatest pain of my life is the reason I'm standing here today. See, sometimes we think the pain is what controls us. It's actually our subconscious mind that if we ever tapped into that, that's what dictates most of our lives. You've got to get grounded. You've got to train your mind to serve you. Just make up your mind. This is not going to control you. You have got to make a declaration. This is what you stand for. You're standing up for your dreams. You're standing up for peace of mind. You're standing up for health. You want it. And you're going to go all out to have it. It's not going to be easy when you want to change. It's not easy. If, if it were in fact easy, everybody would do it. But if you're serious, you'll go all out and say, in spite of this, I'm in control here. I'm going to turn this situation around. I'm not going to sit back and, and moan and cry over what happened and what went wrong and who did what. I'm going to do something about this situation. When God gives you a dream, the dream will always be tested. The pressure in your life right now has a purpose. It's not crushing you. It's pushing what's on the inside of you out. It shows you who you are. So don't fight. It hadn't been easy. It's a dog fight. The road hadn't been successful. Like, it's just a paved road and like each he go this way. It's been rough. It's been crooked. It's been hard. But I've made up in my mind that I will get a reward for the pain that I go through. I will not stop in the middle of the process. I will not be defeated. I will not be destroyed. I will take everything that happens in my life and I will allow the pain to push me to greatness. You will not break me. You will not stop me. You will not defeat me. The only way I lose is if I quit. It's going to be a dog fight. I choose to fight back. Life is rough. You can allow it to destroy you or you can allow it to build you up. Draw the line, ladies and gentlemen. And just say enough is enough. Get out of that narrow-mindedness. Get out of that defeated mentality. Get away from that circle. Get away from those people that don't wish you any good. Get away from those people that don't want you to succeed. Get out of the tent. Get out! 
Here's what's exciting about the passing of time. It takes you through whatever you're experiencing at the moment. That's what time will do, take you through the winter. Now, how do you handle the winters? Make this little note, you can get better and you can get stronger and you can get wiser. There's no winter that you can't overcome. There's no winter that you can't figure out how to survive. You must look out for your enemies. And believe me, we're gonna have some. There's gonna be political enemies. There's gonna be social enemies. There's gonna be people that'll be envious. They will not be your friends. How you gonna show power if you're not up under attack? How you gonna show resistance if something's not trying to pull you over? Resist, resist. Stop being neutral and stop being indifferent. Resist. Take a stand and resist. And each battle brings you to another level. I thank God for the stuff I had to fight. I don't know, I don't know that I've spent a day in my life thanking God for my car. I appreciate the car, but just be walking around the house thanking God. Ooh, thank you for the Mercedes. Thank you for that. Thank you for the Bentley. I have not a day, not a day. Thanking it for stuff. Thank you for this house. Thank you for this pool. Thank you for that. No, 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 no. Because all that stuff, when you get in trouble, you don't even notice it. It don't even make no difference. When you're really up under attack and the enemy's coming after your children and after your health and after your mind, you don't care what you're driving. I might as well be driving a bus. It don't make no difference. But I thank him for the stuff I had to fight. There's nothing as powerful as the human spirit. You can't destroy it. You can pervert it, but you can't destroy it. If you can't fly, run. If you can't run, walk. If you can't walk, crawl. But by all means, keep moving. One of the major things Shov taught me when I met him he said, poor thinking habits keeps most people poor. Not poor working habits. Most people work hard, but they don't think hard. And Shof taught me that the mind is like a factory, a mental factory. And whatever you think about all day long pours ingredients into this mental factory. And that's what builds the economic, social, financial fabric of your life. He quoted me a Bible phrase that says, As you think, so you become. How awesome. When he talked about poor thinking habits, he had me. I used to start the day reading the morning newspaper. I mean, you can believe that or not. I'd get a cup of coffee and read the paper. I'd load up on wars and riots and murders and stabbings and killings and bank robberies and muggings and car wrecks and tragedies. I'd even read the back pages. I seem to like that stuff for some weird reason. I'd load up on all that, and then I'd start the day. You can imagine the kind of days I used to have. The guy says, I want to be a great leader. Wonderful. The first thing we do is follow him to his house. When we get there, we walk in and check his library, number one. Somebody says, well, why check his library? The reason is because what a man reads pours massive ingredients into his mental factory and the fabric of his life is built from those ingredients. You would not believe what some people have got in their house to read. You would not believe. One of the best dressed up words I know for a lot of it is trash. Can you imagine dumping a barrel of trash into this mental factory every day and coming out with a rich, dynamic, positive life? It can't be done. You might as well try making a cake with cement. The kids back in Danbury, Connecticut, high school, they're asking me questions one day. I'm talking to the kids. The kids got good questions these days. One of them said to me, Mr. Rohn, how do you build the good life? I said, it's simple. It's not easy, but it's simple. Here's how you build anything. Select the right ingredients, keep out the wrong ingredients, and it starts with thought. Everything starts with thought. So you must be wise and careful what you think about, because that starts everything. 
you got to be wise. And here. I asked the kids, what would happen if somebody dropped sugar in my coffee? They said, will you be okay? I said, what if somebody dropped strychnine in my coffee? They said, well, you'd be dead. I said, correct. Lesson one, life is both sugar and strychnine. You gotta be careful. I said, what if my worst enemy drops in the sugar? They said, will you be okay? I said, what if my best friend, even by accident, drops in the strychnine? They said, well, you'd be dead. I said, correct. Lesson two, watch your coffee. <laughs> It's necessary you take responsibility for it, that you make it happen, that you don't give up, that you don't take any objection or disappointment or defeats personally, that you keep on keeping on, that you don't decide that I can't make it because you can't see the light at the end of the tunnel, that you realize that's a part of the program. And here's something you've got to resolve. Say this to yourself every day. See, as long as you're breathing, you got to shout at your dream. That's the way I resolve. Say this, please. It's not over until I win. Not over till I get through. Not over till I get over. Not over till I get what I want. Door can't open today, look out. I'm gonna come back and take the hinges off. You've got to have that kind of courage, that type of determination. If you wanna make it happen, it's you. That you've got to take personal responsibility to make it happen. I'm asking you to stand at the door. I'm asking you whatever threatens you, threaten it back. Whatever pushes against you, push it back. Whatever wants to overwhelm you like a father, stand up, take control, and do battle with your enemies wherever you find it. Now here's one more. We must also deal with the enemies within ourselves. Some of the enemies are a lot closer than that. They are within. And I wanna give you a list of some of the things to watch out for when you get back home called enemies within yourself. Here's the first one, indifference. Whatever you do, practice not being casual. You've got to shake off sometimes the lethargy. They would say, oh, well, maybe it's not gonna work for me. Don't be casual. Casualness creates casualties. You've got to deal with it. Indecision is called the thief of opportunity. Make decisions even if it's a wrong decision. Do the very best you can, make a decision and go with it. If it doesn't work out because it was a wrong decision, I'm telling you, that gives you experience now to make a better decision. Here's the next one, doubt. We've all got to deal with the enemy of doubt. Cynicism has a unique way of crowding in on all of us. Being cynical about society, being cynical about the past, cynical about the future. I'm asking you, don't let that disease grab you by the throat and ruin your chances to do well. Yes, it's easy to doubt that it can happen. It's easy to doubt. We've all got fears that want to crowd in. And here's one of the worst ones of all, and that is to doubt yourself. Don't doubt your own ability. Don't doubt your own strength. You can make it through. Next is worry. I mean, you know, you got to worry some. But here's the clue, don't let it conquer you. Mark this down, let worry alarm you, but don't let it conquer you. We all need to be concerned. We all need to be concerned. If there's enemies around, we need to be concerned. If it isn't going well, yes, we need to be concerned. But I'm asking you to let it concern, let it touch you, let it alarm you, but don't let it conquer you. Take all of the worries you've got and try to drive them into the smallest corner you can possibly find. So whatever your enemies are here, drive them into a small corner. Here's the next one. Over caution. Hey, in the spring, if you're too cautious, you never will plant the seed. If you're too cautious, you won't take the chance. If you're too cautious, you won't step out front. Make this note. You got to take a chance. Drive your tendency to be too cautious. Drive it into a small corner. Yes, you can't be gullible. No, you can't go for everything. Yes, you've got to be careful. Yes, but don't be so cautious that it paralyzes you. Don't be so cautious 
that it restricts your chance to do better. See if you can't conquer that. Here's the next one, pessimism. Yes, there's the dark side. Yes, there's the problem side. Yes, there's the difficult side. But I'm telling you, it's not the only side. Yes, the glass is half empty, but it's also half full. Yes, there's the dark side, but there's the light side. Yes, the night comes, but so does the day. I'm telling you, don't be afraid of both sides, opportunity and difficulty, chance and danger. Learn how to handle it all. Now here's the last one. You've got to deal with it. I have to deal with it. We all have to deal with it. And that's complaining. Yes, there's room for a legitimate complaint. But here's what I'm asking you. Don't let complaining master your life. If you become a chronic complainer, I'm telling you, nobody wants to be around you. Chronic complainer. I wouldn't want you for a business partner. Don't let complaining conquer your life. Don't become a victim of yourself. Repeat after me, please, with power and conviction. Say, it's possible. It's all I want you to do when you look at your dream. You say to yourself every day, it's possible. You say that every day to yourself, it's possible. Because what does that do? See, it begins to change your belief system. See, the way in which we operate, ladies and gentlemen, it's a manifestation of what we believe, what's possible for us. Whatever you've done up to this point, all that it really is, is a duplication, it's a reproduction of what you believe subconsciously that you deserve and what's possible for your life. You gotta be careful. See, it doesn't matter who hands you the bad stuff. It doesn't matter where you get the bad stuff. It'll still do its damage on your bank account. Wherever you get. Mr. Schoff gave me one of the greatest phrases when I first met him when he said, Jim, every day stand guard at the door of your mind. How important. Stand guard at the door of your mind. And you decide what goes into your mental factory. Don't let anybody just dump anything they want to in your mental factory because you've got to live with the results. Philosophy is simply what you know. Now to correct a couple of old cliches, what you don't know will hurt you. And to correct another one, ignorance is not bliss. Oh, it's so important to have the correct philosophy. It's so important to know. Philosophy sets the course of your life. Philosophy is simply what you know. So it's important to know. I'm telling the kids these days, make sure you get the information while you're here. I'm talking to the Newport Harbor High School kids in some lectures last year and this year. And my encouragement is make sure you get all the information while you're here. I know it's laborious. I know it isn't easy to read the books and take the classes and try to get good grades. But hey, while you're here, gather it all up. The book you miss will make a difference, right? The information you don't get will make a difference in the legacy of your equities over the next few months, the next few years. So philosophy, this is where it all begins. Now I've divided philosophy into three parts. One is basic, starting out philosophy. The baby starts processing information right away. Cold is bad, warm is good, hungry is awful, food is terrific. The baby starts reacting and processing information and having certain reactions to it. So our philosophy starts early, gathering information and reacting to it. Next is expanded philosophy. At least enough philosophy to be gainfully employed and offer a value to society and find your place in the marketplace. You know, be a reasonable, decent human being. Expanded philosophy. But now how do you become wealthy and powerful and sophisticated? influential and unique. Simple word, refined philosophy. The refinement of philosophy. The extra studies and the extra books and the extra classes and the extra thinking, the extra pondering, the extra give and take of testing ideas and debate and discussion. That's where the extra life comes from is in the dimensions of refined philosophy, the extra thinking. And these are the steps of intellectual discovery that a lot of people just don't want to take or they're too busy to take it or it presents itself in too strong and tough a manner, these extra skills. But I'm telling you, once you start engaging in these extra skills, 
you won't ever want to go back. This new intellectual discovery is where the wealth is. It's where the happiness is, the good life, influence, power. Refinement of philosophy. Now, our philosophy comes from a lot of places. Let me give it to you. Number one, from teaching, the influence of others, from the books we read, from the classes we take. And you might underline the word influence. This is where a big share of our philosophy comes from, influence. In another series, we asked three major questions. Who am I around? That's called big questions. Some questions are little and some are big. This is a big one. Who am I around? Question number two, what are they doing to me? This is called major. This is called big. Where have they got me going? What have they got me reading? What have they got me thinking? What have they got me saying? And the big biggie, what have they got me becoming? Influence plays a major role in the development of our philosophy. How we think, how we speak, the formulation of ideas, the things we weigh concerning values. All of this is so important, what we know, the mind, thinking, processing ideas and information. Ideas are simply information taking form. Now we do something very important with what we know, we weigh it. We put it on our mental scales and we weigh it. And I don't know, we may give it a number from one to 10, probably not consciously, but if we hear something and we come into possession of some information and we give it a 10, we'll probably act on it right away. If we give it a one, we'll probably let it slide. If it's important, we'll do something about it. If we don't think it's important, we'll probably let it go. But it's so important to evaluate. A key word we learn in leadership skill training, perception, trying to find value in something. Where is the value? How valuable is it? How important is it? Is there something here that I can't see at first glance? Is there something below the surface? Is there something in the inner workings of it? What goes behind it? What goes beyond it? What is its origin? All of these questions that help us come to the perception of value, ideas, evaluating information. Now here's what's important to have a good set of mental scales. What if in processing information, your mental scales were off? and you weighed everything a little wrong, do you think that would affect your life? The answer is, of course. And all you got to be is a little off for 10 years. And you can imagine what the difference is. I got a key phrase for you. Life accumulates. We either accumulate the debt or the value. We either accumulate the regret or we accumulate the equity. Now we must all suffer one of two pains, the pain of discipline or the pain of regret. And I'm suggesting discipline, mental discipline to refine ideas. Of course it's laborious and of course it's a push, but it's called small price to pay so that you won't have the regret later on. Regret weighs tons, discipline weighs ounces. So if you accept the early ounces of discipline of thought to refine ideas, and not just let major questions go by. What about society? What about the government? What about taxes? What about religion? What about life? What about capital? What about business? What about society? All of these major questions. What about my life and my value and my place and my future? And what about life? What about origin? What about destiny? What about opportunity? What about possibility? All of these major questions. To let them go casually by is to miss the treasures that your life could accumulate into in the coming months, the coming years. So this is called major. What we ponder and what we think about sets the course of our life. It's like the set of the sail that's taking us somewhere. Let me give you a good question to write down. Where are my thoughts taking me? This is a biggie question. Where are my thoughts taking me? These are some of the things you want to make sure of. You might be able to be casual about some things, but here's some things not to be casual about. My philosophy is taking me somewhere. Big question, where? 